Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Today, we're gonna to make characters. All right, people, as many of you know, I am old school. I started playing D&D &D in 1978 when I was a wee child. Before I could fully read and write, my older brother taught me how to play. But I, I never played basic D&D. &D. I know it's a shocker, right? I was five years old and I just went straight on through to advanced. But a few years ago, this game, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, caught my eye. It had a very gritty, kind of cool, old school feel to it, but with a lot of updates that made it flow better, in my opinion. Um, the other thing is, is that there's a prolific amount of content for this game and a very strong community support base for this game. Um, and the settings are often two things that I absolutely all love about role playing games fantasy and horror. These weird fantasy elements are kind of the core of the definition of this game. Today I thought it'd be cool to make characters by the book. I have the core rules book, but um, for the purpose of today's video, I'm going to run through this in case you've never played this. And if you are one of the uh, people who knows Lamentations of the Flame Princess and I'm doing something wrong, make sure to give me a thumbs down and a big F U in the comments. In this game, you roll 3d6 for each of your ability scores in order. Charisma, constitution, dexterity, intelligence, strength, and wisdom. And then you record them on your sheet. A player can decide to swap the position of one ability score that was rolled with another. Okay, character number one with the wood dice. Five, five, two. That's a 12. Not bad at all. Good start, wood dice. Rolling them up, shaking them up. Six, four, one. Eleven. Six, five, three. Nice. Fourteen. Pretty good so far. Pretty good for three dice. Six, four, one. Eleven. Here's strength. This could be big. Or, well, six, six, two. Fourteen. Six, six, two again, 14. All right, so the wood dice, 12 charisma, 11 constitution, 14 dex, 11 intelligence, 14 strength, and 14 wisdom. Now remember, by the book, I could switch one of those rolls, but I'll make that decision later. If you're unfamiliar with basic fantasy role playing, these stats uh, are similar to the ability scores described in almost every game. Charisma. Um, it's like the measure of your character's aptitude for leadership and the respect that others bestow upon the character's authority. This is the part that I like in the game design is that they, they say what an ability score is and what it isn't. Because I think a lot of people get confused and this is very helpful. It is not a measure of the appeal of a character's personality. Parentheses. The player must portray the character's personality. That is such a crucial, it's a small item, but it's so crucial because I feel like a lot of people in role-playing games have a ability score, like uh, an ability, like charisma. And the person playing that character frankly lacks the charisma to pull off kind of the persuasiveness that is needed in a given social interaction. And they rely instead on a, the roll of a die to influence something rather than describing how they're doing something and actually role playing being persuasive. Um, and in this game, it's, it's hardcore. Charisma modifiers affect both the character's ability to hire retainers and the loyalty of those retainers. You might be like, well, what are retainers? Let me rewind about 35 to 40 years. Um, retainers were an important part of games like Dungeons and Dragons back in the old days. And part of that was because the people who made early fantasy role-playing games like D&D started off as war gamers. And if you were a war gamer, it was important not just to consider your army, but the support system for that army. 
So things like hirelings and retainers were an important part of the idea of going on an adventure, right? If you go on an adventure and you kill a bunch of monsters and you get a ton of treasure, who the fuck is carrying back all that treasure? If you kill 30 orcs, who's carrying back the 30 suits of armor and spears and shields? You gotta have some guys who are pulling a wagon or just fucking carrying things. So that's why it was important back in the day, and I'm guessing that that's why it's important now. So don't count out charisma, because it, it actually does have an impact. All right, constitution. Constitution is the measure of a character's health, vitality, and toughness. Constitution modifiers affect a character's hit points and fitness for certain physical activities, such as traveling long distances. Who is constitution important for? Everyone. It's not a stat that you want to blow off. If you're a squishy magic user, you need constitution, bro, because you need as much like buff to your hit points as possible. But basically, it's, it's an important stat. Dexterity. Dexterity is the measure of a character's agility and reflexes. Dexterity modifiers affect a character's armor class, ability to hit with ranged weapons, and ability to act first in combat. Like many fantasy role-playing games, it affects your ability to shoot bows and arrows and throw spears and daggers and your initiative order, all that kind of stuff, and your armor class um, when feasible. So also kind of important. Intelligence is the measure of a character's knowledge prior to the start of play. Now, I want to emphasize that the description of the intelligent attribute or ability in this game is very subtle but very different from how a lot of people in fantasy role-playing games interpret the intelligence stat. Intelligence is the measure of a character's knowledge prior to the start of play. Intelligence does not measure a character's memory or ability to solve puzzles. It is the player's wits that must be used in these situations. That's so crucial because again, I have personally seen, not just in D&D, but in many other role-playing games, I've seen people use the intelligence score to replace what the player should be responsible for. If the DM sets up a complex um, puzzle system or a, a machine that must be solved to open a door to move on to the next part of the dungeon without activating traps, you, you shouldn't just be able to pick up a D20 and be like, uh, I solve it. Right? That, that, first of all, it takes the fun out of it. But it's also just fucking lame, so don't do that. But I like that they point that out here. I like that intelligence is kind of a measure, measure of that character's wealth of knowledge and education, but that problem solving is incumbent upon the player. That's crucial. Um, intelligence modifiers affect the character's ability to learn languages. They are added to saving throws versus magic user spells. And for magic user, it affects the time and thus expense required to research spells and create magic items, as well as influencing the saving throws of those subject to the magic user spells. So what is intelligence useful for from a functional perspective in this game? Absolutely for magic users, for spell casting components, uh, for research, that kind of stuff. But um, I think it's also valuable if you have a game where you know that having multiple languages is going to be beneficial. So having that, that intelligent character, that educated scholarly character in your party is important. And you know, why not make that the wizard? That's not to say that like your fighter has to be a total dumbass. So, all right, strength. This is typically an easy one. Strength is a measure of a character's raw power. Strength modifiers affect a character's ability to hit in melee combat open stuck doors, or succeed in unarmed combat. Strength is important if you're going to be a fighter type who's using a lot of melee weapons. Um, if you're going to be the muscle in the party, you got to have the strength for it. Wisdom, last of the stats. Wisdom is the measure of a character's connection to the greater universe and the strength of the character's spirit. Wisdom does not affect the character's ability to make good decisions or judge situations or characters. It is the player's own judgment which must be used in these situations. Wisdom modifiers affect the character's non-spell related saving throws, and for clerics it affects the time and thus expense required 
to research spells and create holy items, as well as influencing the saving throws of those subject to the cleric's spells. So again, a very subtle descriptive element there, but what wisdom is not is the character's ability to make good decisions or judge situations or characters. That's the player's judgment. And again, so many people who, who aren't really educated in the sense of how that particular ability or attribute should function, if they had a character with a low wisdom, might want to role play that character as kind of a dumbass who makes bad decisions. Not so, not necessarily so. So it's important to review what these stats are and think about how they affect things in the game and who among the classes needs which stat the most. And that's what we're gonna look at next time when I figure out how to arrange these best and move on to choosing a class. So we'll see you around for the next video, Lamentations of the Flame Process.